Okay, I know it's weird, but please bear with me. First, suppose that 1 plus 1 equals 0. Now I want you to put the hand on your screen, such that it hides either the left or right section of the bar that I just drew in the middle. You can choose whichever side at random, like maybe you could google flip a coin. If it's heads, then hide the left side, and if it's tails, hide the right side. I count down to zero, and when I do reach zero, you'll see some other claim. And I want you to make up your mind on whether it's implied by 1 plus 1 equals zero. Are you ready? Okay then. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. So, what do you think? Chances are you'd argue that what you're seeing right now could be a logical consequence from 1 plus 1 equals 0, right? Now, I want you to keep the hand on your screen for now, because I'll show you something that can be inferred from both 1 plus 1 equals 0 and the consequence you're seeing on the screen. Right now. It is a logical consequence, there is no doubt about it. It simply uses properties of equality, nothing more. After all, when two things are equal to the same thing, then they themselves are equal to each other. So, yeah. Okay, now you can remove your hand and see the problem in hand. Let me summarize a little bit better here. Yeah. If we suppose that 1 plus 1 equals 0, we could defend that 1 plus 1 is different from 2 as 0 and 2 are distinct from each other. However, from 1 plus 1 equals 0, we could also defend that 2 equals 0, because 1 plus 1 is, well, 2, right? And actually, you could even argue none of the above can be derived from 1 plus 1 equals 0. Indeed, either side implicitly assumes things that only apply in a world where 1 plus 1 equals 2, such as 0 and 2 being distinct from each other, or 1 plus 1 being, well, 2. However, there is a secret fourth option that practically no one, aside from mathematicians and logicians, would argue for. This option is actually all of the above. But Alex, you may be asking, how will that make sense? Are you saying that in a world with 1 plus 1 equals 0, we actually have that 0 is both 2 and not 2? Well, my opinion really doesn't matter here. The fact of the matter is, mathematicians would argue that very thing, yes. It feels wrong, because we implicitly use the Bethius thesis, or both thesis, I'm not sure that's pronounced, which states that we can't imply proposition Q and its negation from the same proposition P, in a way. The thing is, Whichever of the four options that you choose as the real logical implication from 1 plus 1 equals 0, there's inherently going to be some sort of arbitrariness. And there will be paradoxes with how we usually use implication in our day-to-day -day lives, because these are all kind of contradictory and they are all defendable in some sort of way. In the case of mathematicians, one such paradox is that, assuming any negatable proposition, which means we can demonstrate their negation, so for example, if we assume 1 plus 1 equals 0, which is a negatable proposition, because we can definitely demonstrate that 1 plus 1 is not 0, so if we assume 1 plus 1 equals 0, then for mathematicians, you can imply literally anything. So, for example, 1 plus 1 equals 0 implies that 1 plus 1 equals 2, but also that 1 plus 1 doesn't equal 2. In order to prove this fact formally, we need to learn about a few rules that mathematicians actually use. Or, well, mathematical logicians, rather. First off, the weakening rule states that when you assume additional stuff, you can't undemonstrate anything. If 
a proposition is demonstrable then, it's still demonstrable now. This also applies for negatability. Whatever is negatable without assuming something remains negatable assuming that thing. Because negatable just means you can demonstrate its negation, so yeah, I mean, obviously that also applies there. We can write that a proposition is demonstrable by saying it's equivalent logically to a tautology, which is the name we give to propositions that we can conclude even without any real condition. For this, we have a generic tautology symbol, which is the funny T-ish symbol here that we call the Varon. Likewise, we can write that a proposition is negatable by saying it's logically equivalent to any contradiction, which is the name we give to proposition whose negation is always deducible. Which, to make the bridge with what we just saw, it just means that the negation of that statement is a tautology. We have a generic um, symbol for contradictions, which is called the falsum. Also, one thing we can say in mathematical logic is when you assume something, it basically means you treat it as though it has a demonstration. You treat it as though it's demonstrable, in other words. I will say it's a pretty natural inference to have when you have the weakening rule, I guess. Anyway, let's start the proof now. We'll start by defining a negatable proposition phi. Now we'll assume phi itself. As I said, assuming phi implies that phi is demonstrable. I mean, it's practically the same thing. Because of how logical equivalences work, and because of the rule of weakening, we can combine the first and third lines to demonstrate the falsum and verum symbols being logically equivalent. In other words, that any tautology is equivalent to any contradiction, which is pretty weird and has weird consequences as well. For now, what that means is that when you assume something that is actually negatable, then any negatable statement is also demonstrable in that very thing. But we're going to show something a bit stronger, and for this we will use what we call the law of excluded middle, which is only used by a specific kind of mathematicians, although a majority, which are mathematicians who use classical logic. And the law of excluded middle basically states that you can always make case disjunctions by first assuming something to be demonstrable in one case, and assuming that very same thing being negatable in the other case. Because of how case disjunction works in formal logic, if you conclude the same thing in either case, then you can directly conclude that shared conclusion. If we go back to our proof, we can establish through the law of Viscolimal that we can deduce any conclusion that you can reach by assuming some proposition psi to be demonstrable on one hand and assuming psi negatable on the other hand. However, because the falsum and verum symbols or equivalent in that situation, that means psi being equivalent to the verum is demonstrable in either case. You can therefore eliminate the disjunction by concluding that psi is demonstrable. This shared conclusion is also just, you know, psi itself, so yeah, by assuming phi, we proved psi. Since phi is an arbitrary negatable proposition, and psi is an arbitrary proposition, period. This proves what I was arguing earlier, when I said all of the above could be a valid response to 1 plus 1 equals 0 problem. Another weird result in classical logic is that we can prove any demonstrable proposition from any proposition whatsoever. Indeed, let's define phi to be a demonstrable proposition this time. If we assume some other thing, psi, we can use the rule of weakening to deduce that phi. Well, yeah, since we've defined phi as demonstrable, that means we can demonstrate it any time, and because of weakening, we can still demonstrate it if we assume psi. In other words, phi is still demonstrable even if we assume psi. This theorem is called exploitation, and I do agree its proof feels like a scam. 
Psy doesn't even have anything to do with Psy here, and the proof really doesn't help with that sentiment. This sort of sentiment kind of shows that, all in all, the choice we make for what we value as the logical implication is mostly arbitrary. All the rules and stuff I showed you are used by mathematicians because it makes our lives easier. Well, aside from previous thesis, this one is completely discarded, but all the rest is used mostly because we're kind of lazy. <laughs> This framework is called classical logic. It's not exactly the only way to do math. After all, some do use intuitionistic logic instead, where they drop stuff like the exclude middle and any equivalent statement. Which is even weirder because now the principle of explosion is not even a theorem, it's a literal principle now. But whatever. Those who are still more convinced by the other three options from the 1 plus 1 equals 0 problem might enjoy what we call connexive logics. whose main principle is Aristotle's thesis. The latter states that propositions can't follow from their own negation. Bethius thesis, I still don't know how it's pronounced, also appears quite often, although depending on your rules of inference it can just as well be equivalent to Aristotle's. Connexive logic is very uncommon in math. Actually, I've never seen it used. But I mean, formalizing connexive logic has to be so hellish, though. Like, I do agree it will improve a few things in terms of mathematical intuition if we dropped material implication, which is the implication that we can kind of use in math right now, and used some sort of connexive implication instead. But I still think there will be paradoxes, just because of the very nature of implication, even in natural language. I mean, fuck, the whole introductory experience shows the apparent incompatibility between 1 equals 0 and 1 plus 1 being different from 2, even though they both seem compatible with 1 plus 1 equals 0. Anyway. The thing is, there are so many logical frameworks, most of which differ from one another because of how they choose implication to work in a way. I mean, there are obviously other things that work, but yeah, it's a pretty solid thing to disagree upon. Pretending that some implication is more logical than another one is completely deluded. Some are more practical. Yes, like classical logic from mathematics, but you have to understand one implication does not suit all situations. I mean, sure, you could call classical implication kind of lazy, but um, actually, I don't know how to come to that. Mathematicians are lazy, <laughs> but at least all stuff works, so who cares? In fact, I'm pretty sure even like Euclid's Elements, which is <laughs> the number two bestseller of the Bible. Um, doesn't even really use the principle of explosion either. By the way, um, what I call principle of explosion here uh, is the fact that any negatable proposition can imply anything. Like, the first proof of that principle was apparently given in the 12th century, 14 centuries after Euclid, so, I'm, so I think I'm right to doubt he used logic that would look anything remotely like classical logic. But well, what do I know? <laughs> I was not there in 300 BC. Huh. I guess I know what I'll ask the doctor next time I see them. Anyway, thanks for watching me nerdly ramble on logic. Have a good day and, uh, I don't know, drink water, <laughs> I guess. Bye.